You know what time it is. Woo! Get into it! Get into it! Yes! Uh, we are back, lovelies. We are back. Hi. Oh my goodness. I messed up again because I forgot to put in. All right, sorry about that, y'all. Y'all know what time it is. It's story time. Get into it. Hold on one second. I'll be right back. Alrighty, y'all. Sorry about that. I get overexcited. I forget to hook everything up. So I apologize if you didn't hear me in the beginning. But like I said, you know what time it is. Get into it! Yes! We are back with Storytime with Chris. And we're going to continue reading our reading of Taran Wander, which is the fourth book of the Pradane Chronicles. Pradane, um, which is a Welsh folklore set of stories based of Walt mythology and folklore. So if you've ever seen Disney's The Black Cauldron, that movie is based off of these books. Technically speaking, actually, the movie is based off of the first book, The Book of Three, and the second book, The Black Cauldron. So, fun fact, if you did not know, the more you know. Uh <laughs> now let's see what happens when Taran, Fluter, and Gurgi, and Dolly continue their journey to find the Mirror of Lunette with the free Kamots, the people of the land of Pradain that live within the northern mountains who interact with the fair folk and the wyverns and dragons and so on. We're going to see what happens next. So buckle up. All right. Chapter 11, Doreth. After eating, the companions stretched themselves on the turf and slept solidly the rest of the day and all that night. In the morning, Dolly took his leave of them. Ka, at Dolly's request, had already begun flying to the fair folk realm with tidings that all was well. From there, the crow would rejoin Taran. I'll go with you if I could, the dwarf said to Taran. The thought of an assistant peakeeper blundering his way through the La Garden... Mountains makes my hair stand on end, but I dare not. Idle Leg must have the jewel safely. And who's to bring it to him? Good old Dolly. <laughs> it saddens me to part with you, Tarn said, but you've helped me more than I could hope. The Lake of Lunette bears the same name as the mirror and perhaps will lead me to it. Farewell then, said Dolly. You've kept us all from being frogs or worse and restored a treasure to us. You'll not regret it. We fair folk have long memories. The dwarf clasped his hands with the travelers and pulled his leather cap tighter on his head. Dolly waved one last time and Tarn watched the dwarf's stumpy figure trudging steadily across a broad meadow growing smaller in the distance until he vanished into the skirting woods and Tarn saw him no more. Through the day, the companions bore northeastward again. Tarn would have glad for Dolly's guidance and keenly missed the gruff dwarf, but his spirits had never been higher. He rode eagerly, lightheartedly. The battle horn swinging from his shoulder gave him fresh courage and confidence. Ilanwi's gift is more precious even than I thought, he told Fluter. I'm glad to Dolly for telling me its power, and more than that for telling me of the Lake of Lunette. It's a strange thing, Fluter. Tarn went on, but somehow I feel closer to the end of my quest. I believe more than ever that I'll find what I'm looking for. Eh? How's that? Fluter answered, blinking as if he had just come awake. Though Gurgi had put all thoughts of Morda behind him, the bard seemed still shaken by his ordeal, and often lapsed into thoughtful silence when he would morosely finger his ears as though expecting them to lengthen at any moment, because remember, he got transformed into a rabbit by the wizard Morda. Dreadful experience, he muttered now. A flab into a rabbit? What were you saying? Th the quest? Uh, yes, of course. 
Smell with whiffings, interrupted Gurgi. Someone cooks tasty crunchings and munchings. You're right, Fluter agreed, sniffing the air. Oh, blast! There goes my nose twitching again. Tarn reined Melalas to a walk. Lion, too, had caught the scent. Her ears forward, she licked hungrily at her whiskers. Shall we see who it is? asked Fluter. I wouldn't say no to a <laughs> hot meal, so long as it isn't a rabbit. Tarin nodded, and his companions rode cautiously through the glade. He had meant to catch a first glimpse of the strangers without himself being seen, but he had gone no more than a few paces when two roughly bearded men rose from the shadows of the bushes. Tarin started. The two evidently posted as guards quickly drew their swords. One of the men whistled a bird call and stared sharply at the companions, but made no attempt to hinder them. In the clearing, Tarn saw some dozen men sprawled around a campfire where collops of heap meat hung sizzling on a spit. Though armed heavily as warriors, the men wore neither the badge nor colors of any Cantreve lord. Some were chewing at their food, some sharpening their blades or waxing their bowstrings. Closest to the fire, stretched at his ease, a heavy-faced man leaned on one elbow and toyed with a long dagger, which he tossed and twirled, catching it first by the hilt, then by the point. He wore a horse-hide jacket whose sleeves had been ripped out. His muddy boots were thick-soled and studded with iron nails. His yellowish hair fell below his shoulders. His cold blue eyes seemed to measure the three companions with an unhurried glance. "'Welcome, lordships,' he drawled as Tarn dismounted. "'What lucky wind blows you to the camp of Dorath?' I am no lord, replied Tarn. I am Tarn, a sister pig keeper. <laughs> no lord? Dorath interrupted in mock surprise, a half smile on his mouth. If you hadn't told me, I never have guessed. These are my comrades, Tarn went on, vexed that he had left Dorath make sport of him. Gurki, Fluter Flam, he wanders as a bard of the heart, but in his own land he is king. And Dorath is king wherever he rides. <laughs> He answered, the yellow man laughing. Now, Lord Swineherd, will you share humble fare? With his dagger, he gestured toward the roasting collops. Eat your fill. Dorat's company never goes short of commons. Then we'll want to know more about three such as you. The harper rides a strange steed, Dorath, called the man with a badly scarred face. <laughs> I wager my mare could stand against the beast. No matter, for she's an evil-tempered brute and a killer bored. Would it not be a merry match? What say you, Dorath? Will we have the cat show us some sport? Hold your tongue, Gloff, Dorath answered, carefully eyeing Lion. You're a fool and always were. He pulled the meat from the spit and thrust it toward the companions. Fluter, having assured himself the roast was not rabbit, ate with a good will. Gurgi, as usual, needed no urging to finish his meal. Tarn was glad to swallow his own share, washing down with a mouthful of harsh-tasting wine Dorath poured from a leather flask. The sun was dropping quickly. One of the bard flung more branches of the fire. Dorath stuck his dagger into the ground before him and looked up sharply at Tarin. And so, lord, said Dorath, have you no traveler's tales to pass the time for my friends and me? Where do you come from? Where do you go and why? The hill countries are dangerous unless a man knows what he's about. Tarin did not answer immediately. Dorath's tone and the look of the men around the fire made Tarin guard his words. We journey northward, through the Lagarden Mountains. Dorath grinned at him. And where then, he asked, or do you call my questions discourteous? To the Lake of Lunette, Tarn answered with some reluctance. I've heard of treasures in those places, put in the man called Golf. Is that what they seek? Is it indeed, Tarn said to Dorath said to Tarn. Treasure? <laughs> He laughed loudly. Small wonder you're a miser with your words. Tarn shook his head. If I find what I seek, it will be more than me, more to me than gold. So? Dorath bent closer to him. But what would such a treasure be, Lord? Jewels? Fine fashion ornaments? Neither. Tarn answered. He hesitated, then said, I seek my parents. Dorath was quiet a moment. The grin did not leave his face, but when he spoke again, his voice was cold. When Dorath asks a question, he wants a truthful answer, Lord Swineherd. Tarn flushed angrily. I have given you one. Say I have not, and you call me a liar? There was a sudden silence between the two. 
Doroth had half risen, his heavy face darkened. Tarn's hand moved to the pommel of his sword, but in that instant a merry burst of music rose from Fluter's harp, and the bard called out, Gently, friends, hear a gay tune to settle our supper. He leaned the beautifully carved harp against his shoulders, and as his fingers danced over the strings, the men around the fire clapped their hands and urged him on. Doroth settled back on the turf, but he glanced at the bard, spat into the fire. Have done, Harper. Tar, Dorat said after a time, your two jangles from that crooked pot will take our rest. You'll stay with us, and in the morning my company will guide you to the Lake of Lunette. Tarn glanced at Fluter. <sighs> Sorry, y'all. I'm trying to turn the page. There we go. And caught the bard's quick frown. He rose to his feet. We thank you for your courtesy, he said to Dorath, but time presses and we mean to travel during the night. Ah, uh, yes, so we do, Fluter put in while Gurgi vigorously agreed. As for the lake, yes, well, we wouldn't think of putting you into the trouble. It's a long journey, far beyond your cantrieve. Predane is my cantrieve, Dorath answered. Have you not heard of Dorath's company? We serve any who will pay us to serve. A weak lord who craves a strong war banner. Three wayfarers who need protection against the dangers of the journey. The many dangers, Harper, he grimly added. Lunette is no more than a step and a jump for my men, and I know how the land lies. Will you go safely? I ask only a little part of the treasure you seek. A small reward to your humble servants. We thank you, Tarn said again. It is already past nightfall. We must find our path. How then, cried Dorath in a great show of indignation. Do you score my poor hospitality? You wound my feelings, lords. It is it beneath you to sleep beside the likes of us? Aha, swineherd, do not insult my men. They might take it amiss. Indeed, as Dorath spoke, an ugly grumble rose from the band, and Tarn saw some of the warriors fingering their swords. He stood uncertain, though well aware of the bard's discomfort. Dorath watched him closely. Two of the men had drifted quietly to the horse lines, and Tarn could imagine that in the shadows they would ease their weapons from their sheaths. So be it, Tarn said, looking Dorath squarely between the eyes. We welcome your hospitality for the night, and tomorrow we take leave of you. Dorath grinned. There will be time to speak of that again. Sleep well. Sleep well, muttered Fluter as they wrapped themselves in their cloaks and uneasily stretched out on the ground. Great Beeler, I'll not sleep a wink. I never liked the hill cantries, and this is one reason more for liking them less. He glanced around him. Dorath had flung himself down near the fire, undoubtedly following his leader's order. The man named Gulf lay close by the companions. I know of such roaming warbands, Fluter went on in a hushed voice. Ruffians and looters, all of them. The Candrieve lord who hires their swords to fight his neighbor soon finds them at his own throat. Dorath protect us from dangers? The worst danger is Dorath himself. He's sure we're after treasure, Tarn whispered. It's in his mind, and he'll not believe otherwise. Luckily it is, in a way, he added ruefully. As long as he thinks we can lead him to gold or jewels, he won't kill us out of hand. Perhaps so, perhaps not, answered Fluter. He may not cut our throats, but he might just as well decide to, uh, shall we say, persuade us to tell him where the treasure is, and I fear he'll do considerably more than tweak our toes. I'm not sure, Tarn replied. If he meant to torture us, I think he'd have tried before this. He put us in a tight corner, and we dare not let him travel with us. Still, I don't believe Dorath is all that sure of himself. We're only three against a dozen, but don't forget Lion. If it comes to a fight, Dorath has an excellent chance of killing us all. Yet I think he's shrewd enough to see. It would cost him too dearly. Perhaps most of his men and himself as well. I doubt he'll risk it unless he has to. I hope you're right, sighed the bard. I'd rather not stay to find out. <laughs> I'd sooner spend the night in a nest of serpents. We must get free of those villains. But how? Tarn frowned and bit his lip. I want to horn, he began. Yes, yes, whispered Gurgi. Oh, yes, magic horn of tootings and hootings. Your help comes with rescuing sounded wise master. I want horn, Tarn said slowly. Yes, that was first in my thoughts, but I use it now? <sighs> Excuse me. It's a precious gift, too precious to waste. If all else fails, he shook his head. Before I sound it, let us try with our own strength. 
Sleep now, he urged. Rest as much as you can. Before first light, Gurgi can go silently to the horse lines and cut the tethers of all of Dorath's steeds, while Fluter and I try to stun the guards, frighten the mounts, scatter them in all directions. Then we ride for dear life! Shh! Put in Fluter. He nodded. Good. It's our best chance. Without blowing that horn of yours, I dare say it's our chance. Only chance. Dorath, he added, cradling his harp fondly in his arms. My tunes jangle indeed. My harp, a crooked pot. That ruffian is never neither ears nor eyes. A flam is forbearing. But when he insults my harp, Dorath goes too far. Shh. Though, alas, Fluter admitted, I've heard the same opinion from a few others. While Gurgi and Fluter drowsed fitfully, Tarn stayed wakeful and uneasy. The campfire burned to embers. He heard the heavy breathing of Dorath's men. Gluff sprawled motionless, snoring atrociously. For a long time, Tarn closed his eyes. Had he chosen wrongly by not sounding the battle horn? He knew painfully that three lives hung in the balance. Doli had warned him not to squander the gift, but was the gamble too great? Should the gift be spent now, would its need was clearest? These thoughts pressed him heavier than the moonless night. As the black sky began to show the first pale traces of gray, Tarn silently ro roused Gurgi and the bard. Cautiously, they made their way to the tethered steeds. Tarn's heart leapt with hope. The two guards were sleeping soundly, their swords across their knees. He turned, meaning to help Gurgi cut the lines. The dark bowl of an oak tree loomed, and he clung to the safety of its shadow. A booted leg thrust out to bar Tarn's way. Dorath was leaning against the tree, a dagger in his hand. And that is where we will end for today. Y'all, I'm telling you, these stories stay with twists and turns, surprises, but that's what makes books so awesome is that when they keep you on the edge of your seat, especially fiction. Even with nonfiction, there's some autobiographies I've read that definitely have me on the edge of my seat. Like, okay, what's going to happen next with this person in their life? That's what I love about reading is that you get so involved and so invested that it takes you to another world. And that's the beauty of it. I think a lot of people miss that point. A movie in your mind, a whole world that you get to invent is all within the turning of a page. I'll see you next time.